And, and that's why we've supported the, uh, the, the, the conversations between developers and, and Crown Estates, and also why I personally have visited uh, the, the Pembroke, Pembrokeshire to ensure that the, uh, the, the growth deal there supports the new infrastructure, the dock, which can allow those projects to be floated out to sea. So we're actually doing a great deal to support a floating offshore wind industry in Wales. Liz Savile Roberts. For Harlech Food Service, a key business in my constituency, the news last week that the UK Government are slashing their energy support for businesses was devastating. They are already struggling under soaring energy bills and interest rate hikes in coronavirus business interruption loan scheme repayments. Can he clarify, will any support be forthcoming on sea bills repayments? And will any savings the Treasury make due to falling wholesale gas prices be ring fenced for targeted support for SMEs and vulnerable households? Speaker, I first of all hope the Honourable Lady will recognise that over the last year the Government have done an enormous amount to support businesses with a guaranteed energy uh, price. The government have been very clear. Well, the government have been very clear that the that, that this uh, support package cannot continue at the current level after uh, April, when the next financial year begins. But the government have said that they'll be making clear fairly shortly what the what the new package will look like. Unfortunately, no government anywhere in the Western world is going to be in a position to completely underwrite and subsidise energy costs for all businesses uh, for, for an indefinite period of time. So we have to confront some realities here. But I hope the Honourable Lady will also be supportive of the fact that the Government are trying to do more to develop energy security within the United Kingdom. And that's why I wonder if she talked to some of her colleagues uh, in the SNP about their opposition to opening up further oil and gas projects in the but North Sea. Which could... but... I would have appreciated an answer on sea bills as well, but we all know that extortionate energy costs are part of this Tory winter of discontent, bookending 13 years of deliberate austerity. Yeah, Key workers yeah. are striking and real incomes are in free fall. Following the last budget, funding for Welsh public services will be worth £3 billion less over the next three years. Enough is enough, and cutting key workers' salaries is not the right answer. Will he urge the Treasury to reverse this decline by establishing a truly fair funding system for Wales which recognises our nation's needs, taking into account age, disability and poverty levels? Mr Speaker, the Honourable Lady will surely be aware that the Welsh Government is receiving £1.20 for public services yeah, yeah. per head for every pound that is spent in England. And that's why it is so difficult to understand why not only are there waiting lists longer in Wales, but the educational outcomes are lower in Wales. And that's after more than 20 years of a Labour Government. And I would say to the Honourable Lady in, the, uh, uh, in Plaid Cymru, perhaps it's time that Plaid Cymru started standing up for the people of Wales and holding the Welsh Labour Government to account instead of propping them up in the Senate. Oh, Williams! Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. Speaker, I have regular discussions with Cabinet colleagues on research funding for universities in Wales, and we are committed to making the UK a science superpower backed by almost £40 billion, the largest ever R&D budget. And last week, actually at the suggestion of the Honourable Member, I was very pleased to visit the cutting-edge research at Bangor University. I remain committed to Welsh universities capitalising on the funding opportunities available. I thank the Secretary of State for that answer. And, uh, he has seen for himself that Welsh universities can and do uh, deliver uh, world-class research. But I think he would accept that the research uh, funding that actually gets is less perhaps that one, than one would expect. And I accept that this is not a simple matter. It's not a matter of counting heads. But what practical help can he give to increase research support in Wales? particularly for new and innovative projects such as the ones that he saw in Bangor. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, in terms of practical support, what I uh, want to do is to visit every single university in Wales over the next few months. I have already met with the UKRI to make clear my concern that the, uh, the relatively low percentage of grant funding that is going into U U Welsh universities for research projects. I want to bring UKRI and those Welsh universities together at an event uh, to Tigwida later on in this year. And given the honourable gentleman's own uh, commitment to this particular issue, I would like to in try and ensure that he is invited to that event as well and is able to attend. Sir Alder Vale. Well, uh, my right honourable friend agree with me that international collaboration is something in which uh, Britain and indeed Wales has a proud history. And that uh, will he continue to keep the pressure up on the European Commission to allow us? Uh, to associate with the H Horizon programme, which would make such a difference for the future of yeah, British yeah. science. 
Uh, Mr Speaker, I agree absolutely with what uh, the honourable gentleman is saying. I would support the Horizon programme, but if for any reason because of intransigence in the European Union it is not possible to do that, I will be making the case to UKRI that Welsh universities can produce some of the best research in this country and should be receiving a higher percentage of the money that is currently available than they are getting at the moment. Sir Christopher Brown. Number four, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. First of all, I would congratulate the Honourable Gentleman on his knighthood in the New Year's Honours List. <laughs> Mr Speaker, we remain committed to working with the Welsh Government on the delivery of investment zones for Wales. This is alongside the Free Ports programme, which will facilitate growth and innovation through benefits like tax reliefs for businesses. Well, that's all very well, but the, basic, the government has basically completely binned its, in, its investment zone policy. I've had a letter from a government minister saying it's all being refocused. It's not about housing and planning anymore. It's about productivity, improving growth and job creation. But there are no details available. All the bids have been binned. So isn't this just further evidence that we don't have a government in this country anymore? We've just got a bunch of rapscallions squatting in ministerial offices. I can't agree with him on those comments. As he will know, many elements of the uh, policy concerned are devolved in Wales, and therefore discussions continue with Welsh Government on those aspects. And I would uh, highlight to him there are 5,400 similar zones in other parts of the world, and we must uh, deliver growth for Britain in a similar fashion. Chair of the committee, Stephen Clark. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I echo the Minister's congratulations to the uh, mem member for Rhonda on his knighthood. What are the lessons of industrial policy over the last 30 years in Wales? Certainly, when you look at the number of failed food parks, science parks, technology parks, is that using taxpayers' money on its own does not create economic activity out of thin air. So does the Minister agree with me that whatever interventions we make or Welsh Government make has to work with the grain of the private sector? And to that end, does he recognise that the overriding strength of the Celtic Freeport bid is that it does work with real projects, real industry to deliver floating offshore wind in the Celtic Sea? Well, Mr Speaker, my right honourable friend is a strong campaigner for the offshore wind uh, possibilities in South West Wales. He will know that there are decisions ongoing in terms of uh, free ports awarding with at least one due in Wales and an announcement to be made shortly. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Over the spending review period, the UK Government is providing the Welsh Government with 20% more funding per person than equivalent UK through UK Government, including the growth deal. And I do hope to be in her constituency in early February uh, for the groundbreaking. As my honourable friend for Llanethley has just reminded the House, the Secretary of State, Minister and his predecessors repeatedly promised that Wales would receive not a penny less to replace EU structural funds to Wales. Not only has he failed to deliver that promise, record inflation his government has presided over has resulted in a double whammy on the Welsh Government budget. Is the Minister aware that higher education has been shut out of his government's flagship levelling up process and hundreds of jobs are now at risk, possibly as many as 600? So why is his government continually letting down people, including young people, across Wales? Well, Mr Speaker, I joined the Secretary of State in the visit to Bangor University last week, and it is absolutely important that we ensure that there are funding mechanisms going forward for higher education. There's an array of schemes uh, through Bayes, and it's important that he and uh, the Government uh, work on ensuring that the university sector is supported in Wales. And the Chamberlain. Seven, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I have regular discussions with Cabinet members on a range of transport measures. Over £340 million has been provided for rail enhancements in Wales, including at Cardiff Central Station and for the electrification of the Seven Tunnel. Wendy Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Government's failure to end rail strikes impacts all of us across the UK. Like Scotland, transport is devolved in Wales, but we need people coming from England into our countries to give much-needed revenue for tourism and hospitality. In Wales, a pay agreement has been reached, but their own railways can't function on strike days because of UK-managed maintenance responsibilities. So the Secretary of State outlined what he's doing to resolve these damaging strikes and get railways up and running again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Mr Speaker, I must confess I, I failed to hear very much of that question, and I apologise for that. I heard the Honourable Lady ask what I was going to do to get uh, railways up and running again. I'm not particularly certain which one she was referring to. Um, but uh, it puts me in a slightly difficult position as far as answering is concerned. But I will honestly say to the Honourable Lady, we spent £340 million pounds on railways uh, over this control period, including £125 million of the Core Valley Lines, £4.7 million on St Clair Station, £4 million on the Bow Street Station, £2.7 million on the Cambrian Line. Mr Speaker, in addition to that, we have spent money on projects such as the electrification of the South Wales Line. The, uh, uh, the Cardiff Capital Region South Wales Metro is funded partly from the UK Government through a growth bill, and our commitment to the railways is at Secretary State. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Direct train services between South Wales and Devon are a key part of our rail infrastructure, yet are mostly operated by older, less reliable rolling stock. But what does he see of the prospects being to getting new, more modern trains operating these routes? Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, I'm pleased to be able to tell the honourable gentleman that more modern uh, stock is currently being rolled out on those particular routes, so the honourable gentleman will be able to benefit from more comfortable uh, carriages, which are also going to emit less carbon and therefore be better for the environment. Jerome Mayo. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Roads are a devolved matter, and the decision to close the Menno suspension bridge was therefore made by the Welsh Government. Work has commenced on the emergency replacement of brittle hangars dating back to 1938, and this will be followed by additional maintenance works. Welsh Government ministers assure me that, subject to safety assessments, the bridge is due to reopen at the end of this month. Jerome Mayu. Mr Speaker, the Menai Bridge supplies the lifeblood of tourism to Anglesey and the wider region. Given Welsh Labour's negligent handling of the maintenance of this bridge and now its closure for months, how does my right and wrong friend think Welsh Labour is doing on their manifesto commitment to rebuild tourism in Wales? Well, I thank my honourable friend for that question. Quality road infrastructure is vital to unlocking the potential of the North Wales visitor economy. I do believe there are questions to be answered about the specification of the contracted PFI maintenance schedule for the bridge, awarded by the last Labour UK Government in 1998, and about the stalled consideration of a third crossing of the Menai Strait. I urge the Welsh Government to publish the findings of the Roads Review and resume the improvement of the North Wales Road Network. Michael Fabrica. Question 9, sir. Mr Speaker, um, I have regular discussions with the Welsh Government on increasing investment in Wales and supporting the Welsh economy. Our plans to release one Welsh freeport alongside our investment in infrastructure will act as a catalyst for further investment from the UK and beyond. Well, I'm grateful to my right honourable friend for his answer. During COVID, a number of Welsh nationalists, not all but some, used that opportunity in the closure of the Welsh border to incite anti-English feeling. And now we hear that Plaid Cymru, working with Labour, are going to introduce a hotels and other tax. What does he think that does for English investment into Wales? Well, Mr Speaker, I want to see people visiting Wales from England and from all over the world, and I'm sure that all those who do so will, will appreciate the, uh, the natural beauty and all that Wales has to offer to the tourism industry. So I was disappointed that there were some people who appeared to be indulging in anti-English rhetoric during the COVID crisis. I hope all members of this House, all members of this House, I think, would condemn the, that sort of behaviour. Uh, and I, I would simply say I want to do more to encourage tourism, and that's why I regret the fact that the Welsh Labour Government are bringing in a tourism tax. A tax on tourism is an attack on the tourist industry. The Governor. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On the subject of investment between England and Wales, progress on speeding up the Wrexham to Bidston line is about as slow as the trains on the Wrexham to Bidston line. So can I ask the Secretary of State for Wales what he personally has done to improve rail connections between North Wales and Liverpool? Speaker, I, I, I'm sure I speak for the whole government in saying that we are completely committed to better rail connections across the United Kingdom. I'm well aware of the, uh, the, the line between Wrexham and, and Bidston. I'm also aware that that went through a, a, a business case procedure, uh, which was uh, not, not completely positive about it. 
But I can assure the honourable lady there are a number of projects in the RNEP uh, proposals which will be discussed shortly by the Department for Transport. That completes Welsh questions. Before we come to the Prime Minister's questions, I would like to point out that the British Sign Language Interpretation of Proceedings is available to watch on Parliament Live TV. We start with questions to Prime Minister Kate Knifton. Yeah, yeah, Question yeah, number one, yeah. please, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I know members from across the House will be as shocked and appalled as I am about the case of David Carrick. The abuse of power is truly sickening, and our thoughts are with his victims. The police must address the failings in this case, restore public confidence, and ensure the safety of women and girls. There will be no place to hide for those who use their position to intimidate those women and girls or those who have failed to act to reprimand and remove those people unfit from office. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Kate Knight. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the project champion for the North Midlands Manufacturing Corridor, next week I am bringing together businesses, leaders and local councillors from across the region in Parliament to set out to Department for Transport officials the importance of the A50, A500 corridor. The Prime Minister understands the importance of investing in our infrastructure and unlocking the potential of our towns and cities. So will he urge government colleagues from Bays and DLUC to attend the meeting and to hear more about the benefits this investment would bring to our region? Mr Speaker, the Government recognises the strategic importance of the A50, A500 corridor to the Midlands. I know final decisions on this scheme will be made in the third road investment strategy, which is fully published next year, but I know my honourable friend will be contacting ministers in the relevant departments to invite them to hear her case. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join with the Prime Minister in his comments about the dreadful case of Carrick? Mr Speaker, it is three minutes past twelve. If somebody phones, if somebody phones 999 now because they have chest pains and fear it might be a heart attack, when would the Prime Minister expect an ambulance to arrive? Yeah. Oh. Mr Speaker, it is absolutely right that people can rely on the emergency services when they need them, and that is why we are rapidly implementing measures to improve the delivery of ambulance times and, indeed, urgent and emergency care. But I'd say to the honourable gentleman, if he cares about ensuring that patients get access to life-saving emergency care when they need it, why won't he support our minimum safety legislation? Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister could deflect all he likes, but for the person for the person suffering from chest pains, the clock started ticking straight away. Every minute counts. Yep. Yeah. That's why the government says an ambulance should be there in 18 minutes. In that case, it would mean just about 20 past 12. Now, I, don't, I know he doesn't want to answer the question I asked him, so I'm going to ask him again. When will that ambulance arrive? Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, because of the extra funding we're putting in to relieve pressure in urgent and emergency care departments, because of the investment we're putting in in ambulance call handling, we will improve ambulance times as we are recovering from the pandemic and indeed the pressures of this winter. But I say to the honourable gentleman again, because he makes my case for me, he describes the life-saving care that people desperately need. So why? When in other countries like France, Spain, Italy and others, why is he depriving people here that care? Mr Speaker, he obviously doesn't know or doesn't care. I'll tell him. If our heart attack victim had called for an ambulance in Peterborough at 12.03, it wouldn't arrive until 10 past two. These are our constituents waiting for ambulances I'm talking about. If it was Northampton, it wouldn't arrive until 20... Order, order, order. order. Mr Blister, I hope you want to see the rest of the questions out, because I want you to be here. We're going to have to behave better. Come on, Mr Starmer. Mr Speaker, I'm talking about our constituents. If they were in Northampton, it wouldn't arrive until 20 past two. If they were in Plymouth, it wouldn't arrive until 20 to three. 
That's why someone who fears a heart attack waiting more than two and a half hours for an ambulance. Not the worst case scenario, just the average wait. Yep. So for one week, will he stop blaming others, take some responsibility and just admit under his watch the NHS is in crisis, isn't it? Well, Mr Speaker, I noticed the one place the honourable gentleman didn't mention was Wales. Where we know ambulance times are even worse than they are in England, Mr Speaker. No, and the reason, the reason that is the case, because this is not about politics. This is about the fact that the NHS in Scotland, in Wales, in England is dealing with unprecedented challenges, unprecedented challenges recovering from COVID, dealing with a very virulent and early flu season, and everyone is doing their best to bring those wait times down. But again, I'll ask him. If he believes so much in improving ambulance wait times, why won't he times? Why won't he support our minimum safety legislation? Mr. Speaker, he won't answer any questions and he won't take any responsibility. By one o'clock, our heart attack victim is in a bad way: sweaty, dizzy, chest tightening. This is a heart attack and they're shouting, this is your constituent. By that time, they should be getting treatment. But an hour after they've called 999, they're still lying there, waiting, listening to the clock tick. How does he think they feel knowing an ambulance could be still hours away? Well, Mr Speaker, the specific and practical things we are doing to improve ambulance times are clear. We are investing more in urgent and emergency care to create more bed capacity. We are ensuring that the flow of patients through emergency care is faster than it ever has been. We are discharging people at a record rate out of hospitals to ease the constraints that they are facing. And we are reducing the call-out rates by moving people out of ambulance stacks and being dealt with in a community. Now, These are all very practical steps that will make a difference in the short term. But I ask him again and again, and we know why. The reason that he is not putting patients first when it comes to ambulance waiting times is because he is simply in the pockets of his union paymaster. Mr Speaker, this isn't hypothetical. This is real life. Stephanie from from Plymouth was battling cancer when she collapsed at home. Her mum rang 999 desperate for help. She only lived a couple of miles from the hospital, but they couldn't prioritise her. She was 26 when she died waiting for that ambulance. A young woman whose life was ended far too soon. And as a dad, I can't even fathom that pain. So on behalf of Stephanie and her family, will you stop the excuses, stop shifting the blame, stop the political games, and simply tell us when will he sort out these delays and get back to the 18-minute wait. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, of course Stephanie's case is a tragedy. Of course people are working as hard as they can to ensure people get the care they need. But he talks about political games. He is a living living example of playing political games when it comes to people's health care. I have already mentioned what has been going on in Wales. Is he confident in the Labour-run Wales NHS that nobody is suffering right now? Of course they are, Mr Speaker, because the NHS everywhere is under pressure. What we should be doing is supporting those doctors and nurses to make the changes that we are doing to bring the care to those people. But I'll ask him this. If he is so, so concerned, so concerned about making sure that the Stephanies of the future get the cares they need, why? Why is he denying those families the guarantee of emergency life-saving care? So that's his answer to Stephanie's family. Deflect, blame others, never take responsibility. Just like last week, he won't say when he's going to deliver the basic minimum service levels people need. Mr Speaker, over the 40 minutes or so that these sessions tend to last, 700 people will call an ambulance. Two will be reporting a heart attack. Four will be reporting a stroke. But instead of the rapid help they need, 
Many will wait and wait and wait. So if he won't answer any questions, will he at least apologise for the lethal chaos under his watch? Yeah. M- M- Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, he, uh, he asks about the minimum safety levels. We, we will deliver them as soon as we can pass them. Why won't he vote for them, first of all? But, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we are we are delivering on the people's priorities, as we've seen this week. The honourable gentleman will just say anything if the politics suits him. It's as simple. That. He will break promises left, right, and centre. He promised to nationalise public services. He promised to have a second referendum. He promised to defend the mass migration of the EU. And now we're apparently led to believe that he. Oh, oh, I expect the front bench just to keep a little quiet, because if they don't, there's somewhere else for them to shout their noise. Mr. Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, if we are going to deliver for the British people, people need to have strong convictions. But when it comes to the honourable gentleman, he isn't just for the free movement of people, he's also got the free movement of principles. Mr Speaker, on Monday, the independent Net Zero Review was published by my honourable friend, the member for Kingswood. Does my right honourable friend join me in welcoming many of those recommendations, and in particular to provide clarity and continuity to all those working to decarbonise our economy, especially those uh, supporting South Shropshire Climate Action Group in my constituency? Well, Mr Speaker, can I thank my right honourable friend, the member for Kingswood, for his review, but also pay tribute to my right honourable friend for his work in this area. Uh, I'm pleased that the report recognised the UK's leadership in tackling climate change and catalysing a global transformation in how other countries are dealing with it. Uh, We have, as the report acknowledged, exceeded expectations to decarbonise and we're responding to the full range of uh, the review's requests and recommendations in the coming year. Leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn. Mr Speaker, to promise is a thing to keep it is another. Well, the Scottish Government kept their manifesto promise to the people, and thanks to support from members of all political parties in Holyrood, the GRR Bill was passed. Surely in that context, the Prime Minister must recognise that it is a dangerous moment for devolution when both he and indeed the Leader of the Opposition seek to overturn a promise made between Scotland's politicians and Scotland's people. Mr Speaker, let me be crystal clear that the decision in this case is centred on the legislation's consequences for reserved matters, as is laid out in the Scotland Act, which established the Scottish Parliament, which the Honourable Gentleman talks about, and at the time supported by the SNP, this bill would have a significant adverse effect on UK-wide equalities matters, and so the Scottish Secretary, with regret, has rightly acted. No evidence. Mr Speaker, let me be crystal clear. This is the Conservative Party seeking to stoke a culture war against some of the most marginalised people in society, and Scotland's democracy is simply collateral damage. And on that issue of democracy, let's reflect, because on Monday the UK Government introduced legislation to ban the right to strike against the express wishes of the Scottish Government. On Tuesday, they introduced legislation to overturn the GRR against the express wishes of the Scottish Government. And this evening, they will seek to put in place legislation that rips up thousands of EU protections against the express wishes of the Scottish Government. Are we not now on a slippery slope from devolution? to direct rule. Yep. Yeah. No, 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 Mr. S- no, Mr Speaker, of course we're not. This is simply about protecting UK-wide legislation, about ensuring the safety of women and children. This is not about the devolution settlement. I would urge the honourable gentleman and his party to consider engaging with the UK government on this bill as we did before the legislation passed, so that we can find a constructive way forward in the interests of the people of Scotland and the United Kingdom. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The 
care, education and support that children receive in their earliest years has the biggest impact on their future life outcomes. And that's why the affordability, accessibility and quality of childcare is so important for families in Eddersbury and right across the country. Yet, despite significant investment by the UK Government since 2010, for too many families the childcare system remains inflexible, complex and expensive. So, can I ask my right honourable friend to restate to this House his commitment to address this essential and pressing issue so that every child can have the best start in life? Yeah. Well, I know this is a, a topic my honourable friend knows very well from his uh, own background, and he's right that it is essential to access quality childcare, which is why we provide every three and four year old eligible with at least 15 hours a week of free childcare. And we are considering new plans to improve the cost, choice and affordability of childcare, whether consulting on ratios or indeed supporting more people to become childminders. Transport Secretary implying NHS workers are deliberately putting people in danger. A Health Secretary pitting dedicated nurses against vulnerable patients. Does the Prime Minister really expect the public to believe that the very people who have dedicated their lives to saving life and limb are so reckless? Or is it not the case that this government have pushed them to their absolute limit and they have no other option but to strike? Uh, Mr Speaker, we have enormous respect and gratitude for all our public sector workers, especially those uh, in the NHS, which is why we have backed them with not just record funding, but also record investment in more doctors and nurses, 15,000 more doctors, 30,000 more nurses and more life-saving equipment, which will help them do their jobs, and we continue to want to engage constructively in dialogue with them. David Simmons. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. Ryslip, Northern and Pinner has a great many car-dependent uh, older and disabled constituents, many of whom are horrified to read that the Mayor of London may have manipulated the outcome of his own consultation may have manipulated the outcome of his own consultation in order to impose an unwanted £12.50 daily charge every time they go to a medical appointment or attend hospital. So does my right honourable friend agree with me? that any further rollout of the ULES should be paused until these matters have been fully investigated. Yeah. Well, my, uh, my honourable friend has rightly pointed out that transport in London is devolved to the Labour Mayor of London, and it is disappointing that the Mayor, backed by the Leader of the Opposition, is choosing not to, listening, not to listen to the public, expanding the zone against the overwhelming views of residents and businesses. I urge the Mayor to properly reconsider and respond to these serious concerns. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister showed his card this week by ramming through the sacking nurses' bill. He has, he, has, he has literally gone from clapping nurses to sacking them. His Transport Secretary has said that the bill is unworkable and the Education Secretary has said that it is not, it is not needed. Why does he still want the bill? Yeah. Mr Speaker, it was the Labour Party that showed their cards this week when it came to backing working people. What I'd say, what, what I'd say, what I'd say to the honourable gentleman, what I'd say, what I'd say to the honourable gentleman, if he really cares about supporting patients, if he really cares about children getting the education they receive, if he really cares about working people being able to go about their lives free from disruption, he should join actually in legislation which is prevalent in many other countries, ensure minimum safety levels in our critical public services and get off the picket lines himself. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Continuing a theme, uh, evidence is now very clear that the London Mayor's sham consultation here, here. has suppressed 5,000 negative responses from members and supporters of Fair Fuel UK, of which I am the APPG chairman. Now, what angers me is this is a tax against my residents in South Thanet. It's a tax against Kent residents. It's a tax against all of the home counties. This is true taxation without representation. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, will my right honourable friend assure me he will do all that he can to stop this, because it is a tax that is a fill-up against a failed mayor's budget yeah. and a failed mayor. Yeah. 
Well, my, my honourable friend makes an excellent and powerful point. The Labour mayor is imposing this tax on a public which does not want it. He's right to highlight that. Expanding this zone is not something that communities want, and I look forward to working with him to urge the mayor to properly consider and respond to all these views and stop this unfair tax. When, David? Mr Speaker, during a period of 12 months, two of my Cofinicus ones have lost their lives after being attacked by dangerous dogs, a 10-year-old boy and a senior citizen. Fatalities have also occurred in other parts of the country. It is clear that the Dangerous Dogs Act is woefully inadequate. Yes. The government has commissioned studies. It has debated the subject at length, but it has done nothing. No. My question is, when will the government take action on the issue of dangerous dogs? Yeah. 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 Well, my, uh, my, the Honourable Gentleman raises uh, a very important case, and I'm very sorry to hear about the specific families that he mentions. And we recognise that dog attacks can have horrific consequences, and I want to assure him that we take the issue incredibly seriously. And that's why we've established a working group between police, local authorities, and other key stakeholders to consider all aspects of tackling irresponsible dog ownership. That working group will make its recommendations later this year, and of course, the government will respond promptly. Karen Bradley. Speaker. Yeah. Mr Speaker, Staffordshire, Staffordshire Moorlands District Council, run by the Conservatives, has an excellent track record of delivering for my constituents whilst keeping council tax low. We have put a bid in to the levelling up fund, and I know that that money would make such an incredible difference to my constituents. So will he use his good office to encourage the Department for Levelling Up to look favourably on us this week? Well, um, my, uh, my right honourable friend has been a stalwart champion for her community, and in particular their levelling up fund bid, which I know will make a massive difference to her community. I wish her and her constituents every success when we announce the next successful round of bidders to that fund. Sarah Green. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Many of my constituents in Cheshire and Amersham are struggling to keep up with their energy bills this winter. When they do fall behind, too often families are punished by being switched over to prepayment meters which are more expensive which does nothing to help the financial situation will the prime minister back our call to ban energy companies from forcibly installing prepayment meters and stop energy companies from switching smart meters over to prepayment meters remotely well, uh, Mr. S Mr Speaker, I want to assure the Honourable Lady that Ofgem actually has specific regulations in place regarding the use of prepayment metres and how energy companies should treat those that are struggling with their bills. But what I am pleased to say is that her constituents will receive around £900 at a minimum of support with their energy bills this winter as a result of the actions of this Government. Jake Leplasty. Will my right honourable friend join me in paying tribute and thanks to the several thousand people at MOD Defence Equipment and Support at Abbey Wood in my constituency who work tirelessly to ensure that the military equipment and supplies that we have pledged to the people of Ukraine are dispatched quickly and efficiently. And does he agree with me that events in Ukraine are a reminder yet again of the need to invest more in our own sovereign defence manufacturing capability? Yeah. 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 Well, Mr Speaker, Honourable Friend makes an excellent point, and I'm happy to join him in paying tribute to his constituents at the MOD facility. The work they are doing is making a critical difference in the fight to combat Russian aggression in Ukraine. I know it's extremely appreciated both by the President of Ukraine and his people, and he's right also that it highlights the need for more investment, which is why we're putting £24 billion of investment into our armed forces, but also increasing the amount of kit that we manufacture here at home. Delivery. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's almost a, a year to the day since the then Business Secretary, uh, in a visit to the British Rural site in my constituency, promised the company £100 million and proudly boasted to the national media that he couldn't think of a, a better project that better demonstrated levelling up. Yesterday, the company and our administration haven't received not a penny in financial support from the government. Would the Prime Minister agree with me that there's not a single project in the country that better demonstrates the government's lack of industrial strategy, failure of levelling up, 
an abandonment of the North East. Well, Mr Speaker, first of all, let me say my thoughts are with the company's employees and families at the time, and we stand ready to support those impacted. Now, let me just let me just outline for the Honourable what exactly has happened. We did offer significant support to British Vault through the Automotive Transformation Fund, considerable amount of funding, but entirely reasonably, and it's not something that I expect the Labour Party to understand, that support was conditional on the company receiving private investment as well, which I think is a sensible protection for taxpayers. Unfortunately, that didn't materialise, but I think it's completely wrong completely wrong to take from that about the, what else is happening in the North East. Across the North East, there is new investment in the new Envision and Nissan plant, in electric vehicle manufacturing, a billion pound investment in the North East. Just look at what's happening in Teesside or on clean energy. This government is committed to the North East and it will deliver more jobs and opportunity under this Conservative administration. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has long been a friend to business. As Chancellor, he listened to businesses in Stoke-on-Trent Central about yeah, their yeah, issues. Yeah. Stoke-on-Trent has a wide range of manufacturing, fabrication and engineering excellence. Does he agree with me that growing these activities is a vital strand of our levelling up ambitions? And may I invite him to revisit my constituency to meet with them? Yeah. Yeah. Why, uh, my uh, my honourable friend is an excellent champion for her constituents, and particularly her advanced manufacturing uh, businesses, which I've had the pleasure of visiting with her in the past. It's important that we support those businesses on energy prices, which we are doing through the announcement the Chancellor recently made, particularly with regard to generous support for energy-intensive industries. And indeed, they can also apply for up to £315 million of capital grant funding to help them make the transition to net zero. On Butler. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, when I had breast cancer, I had phenomenal nurses. When I had to be rushed to the A&E, the ambulance crew looked after me. Unison GMB, they're on strike because no one's negotiating with them. Mr Speaker, for the first time in the Royal College of Nursing History, yes. they have balloted and they are on strike yes. today. I've spoken to the General Secretary of the RCN. She's adamant she wants to end the disputes. She just needs a meeting with the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister show leadership and meet with the RCN? Just a simple yes or no. Mr Speaker, at the turn of the year, the Government wrote to all unions, including the RCN, to invite them for frank, open, honest, two-way dialogue with relevant secretaries of state. I'm pleased that those meetings are happening in a range of sectors, and I hope that we can find a constructive way through this. Um, Speaker, as we approach Holocaust Memorial Day, colleagues can sign the early day motion, they can sign the Book of Commitment, they can attend the various commemorative services. I have to report some very sad news to the House, that the well-known Holocaust survivor, Ziggy Shipper, died at the age of 93 in the early hours of this morning. He went out, he was a survivor of Auschwitz, Birkenau and Stotthaus, Stotthof concentration camps. He spent his life in this country spreading his message of hope to young people. Will my wonderful friend uh, join with me in thanking Ziggy for his life, for his message, which is very vitally important as we sit here today. Do not hate. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm very sorry to learn that Ziggy has passed away, and my thoughts are, of course, with uh, his family. Uh, I know he was a, a man with wonderful, wonderful energy and humanity, and I pay tribute to him for his work, and indeed all Holocaust survivors who have so bravely shared their testimonies. We must have never forget the Holocaust, and as my honourable friend rightly said, I know the whole House will join me and him in echoing Ziggy's message, which is poignant and accurate. Do not hate. Graham Stringer. Will the Prime Minister join his Conservative uh, predecessors in guaranteeing that the HS2 project uh, reaches Manchester, or does he still believe? Uh, that investment should be taken for poorer areas in the north and given to the more affluent parts of Kent. Mm. Mr Speaker, this government is investing record sums in uh, transport infrastructure across the country, but especially in the north and midlands with the £96 billion integrated rail plan, which will improve journey times east-west across the north and connectivity across the east midlands. It's a record we're proud of, and now we'll get on with delivering it. Richard Fuller. 
Ika, there's been a 40 per cent increase in patients on roll with GPs in Biggleswade in the last 15 years, but last week proposals for a Biggleswade health hub were not progressed, despite support, financial support from Conservative-controlled Central Bedfordshire Council. So can my right honourable friend advise me what is the status of our manifesto commitment to infrastructure first, and will he and his ministers work with me to bring together the various parts of the NHS to bring the Biggleswade, Biggleswade Health Hub back on track? Well, I'd be very happy to organise a meeting for the Honourable Gentleman to discuss how to progress his project. He's right about the importance of primary care. There is more investment going in, but we want to make sure it works for his constituency, and I look forward to arranging a meeting with him with the relevant minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister is well aware of the injustice of prepayment metres, not briefly recently because he commented on it earlier in a question, because it's long-standing. Higher tariffs and higher social charges. Why then? Has he allowed a situation where hundreds of thousands have been forced into that penury at a time when winter is upon us and prices are rocketing and where we face a situation of 8.4 million people facing fuel poverty in April? All he requires to do is to instruct, through himself or through a minister, off GEM to ensure that there is an equalisation of tariffs between debit and credit and also that his government takes steps to provide a fund for those who have seen debt arise because of his government's failures. Will he end that manifest injustice of the poor paying most? Yeah, yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I think the Honourable Gentleman's proposal would also increase bills for many millions of families, so I'm not sure it is the right approach. But what we are doing is providing around £900 of specific support with all families' energy bills this winter. There's further targeted support for those who are most vulnerable, which is absolutely the right thing to do. And, as the Chancellor has already announced, we're consulting on what the best thing to do going forward, including options, as he mentioned, such as a social tariff, as part of our wider reforms to the retail energy market. Laura Farris. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Every single country in the G7 requires some level of minimum service to be provided when strikes take place in essential public services, often with laws that actually go much further than that. Does my right honourable friend agree that the British people should be entitled to the same basic level of protection when strikes take place in these services? And does he think the former Labour Prime Minister Tony Blair had a point when he said last year the big defect at the birth of the Labour Party was its tie to organised labour. Yeah. Well, well, Mr Speaker, Mr. Well, my honourable friend put it very well, but she's right to make the point that what we are proposing is in line with the vast majority of other countries around the world. Indeed, many countries ban strikes in blue light services altogether. We are not doing that. We are joining countries across continental Europe and having minimum safety uh, laws, which I think reasonably the public would expect to have a level of emergency life-saving care in the event of strikes. I think that's a common sense, reasonable position to take, and we all know why the party opposite can't bring themselves to support it. Alex Shervel. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This month, the right honourable member for Stratford-upon-Avon was forced to pay millions to HMRC to settle a tax dispute. Was the Prime Minister aware of the investigation when he appointed him to his Cabinet and as Chairman of the Conservative Party? Will the Prime Minister demand accountability from his Cabinet members about their tax affairs? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, my, uh, my honourable friend has already addressed this matter in full, and that's nothing more that I can add. Let's shift, comes. Speaker. If I may, I would like to begin by putting on record this House's heartbreak at the tragic death this morning of our friend Dennis, the Minister of Interior Affairs in Ukraine, and his deputy, and all those who were killed in that tragic accident. I am sure this <coughs> House is united in our feeling on that. Turning to more local affairs, as many have pointed out, the Government, I understand, is in the final furlongs of giving out its levelling up bids, and I must ask him to look kindly upon building the borough market of the Midlands and building a future Meditech hub in Rutland. So can can he assure me that not just urban but also rural areas will be levelled up? Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me join with my honourable friend in, in paying tribute to the family of the Interior Minister in Ukraine. I know our thoughts uh, will be with him uh, at this difficult time. Uh, and also, I can confirm to her that this government believes levelling up should apply equally everywhere across our United Kingdom. Urban and rural communities up and down the country will get the benefit of having the investment that they deserve, making sure that we can spread opportunity and ensure everyone has pride in the place that they call home. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. 
David Cameron said the Scottish Parliament was one of the most powerful devolved parliaments in the world. Yeah. Yet the Prime Minister continues to block the Scottish Parliament's clear mandate to allow Scots to choose their own future. Yep. And on Monday, he sent his MPs through the lobbies to deny Scottish workers' right to strike, despite overwhelming Scottish Parliament opposition. And on Tuesday, he sent his Secretary of State for Scotland yep. to block an act of the Scottish Parliament voted for by 70% of MSPs, including yep. Tories. Yep. Does he still think that David Cameron's ridiculous assertion holds any water? Whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, uh, there have been 347 acts passed by the Scottish Parliament, which is undeniably one of the most powerful devolved legislatures anywhere in the world. In this exceptional case, it's clear that the Act does have adverse consequences for UK-wide equalities legislation. So, in those very exceptional circumstances, the Scottish Secretary has regretfully taken the decision to block passage of the legislation. But, as I said previously, we want to engage in a dialogue with the Scottish Government to ensure that we can find a constructive way through. The British people rightly expect us to be able to control our borders, so I was very pleased that the Prime Minister made one of his five priorities the need to stop the boats in the Channel. Can he reassure me and my constituents in Newcastle under Lyme that not only will we bolster the patrols on the French beaches, but we will make sure that people who do make that dangerous journey and arrive are removed? Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is right that this is a priority for all our constituents. Uh, He's right to highlight the new deal that we have with France, which which increases funded patrols on French beaches by 40 per cent. And as he said, we must go further to solve this problem once and for all. And that means introducing new legislation that makes it unequivocally clear that if you enter the UK illegally, you should not be able to stay here, but instead will be swiftly detained and removed. Imran Hussain. Fine. Uh, Mr Speaker, last night the BBC revealed the Foreign Office knew the extent of Narendra Modi's involvement in the Gujarat massacre that paved the way for the persecution of Muslims and other minorities we see in India today, with senior diplomats reporting that the massacre could not have taken place without a climate of impunity created by Modi and that he was, in the FCO's own words, directly responsible for this violence. Given that hundreds were brutally killed and that families across India and the world, including here in the UK, are still without justice, does the Prime Minister agree with his diplomats in the Foreign Office that Modi was directly responsible? And just what more does the Foreign Office know of his involvement in this grave act of ethnic cleansing? Mr Speaker, the UK Government's position on this has been clear and long-standing and, and hasn't changed. Of course, we don't tolerate persecution where it appears anywhere, but I'm not sure I agree at all with the characterisation that the Honourable Gentleman has put forward. That completes Prime Minister's questions. I'll just let the Chamber clear. Right, we now come to the urgent question. I call the show secretary, Jonathan Reynolds. Thank you, Mr Speaker. To ask the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy if he will make a statement on the UK's gigafactory capacity given the announcement of British Vault entering into administration. Thank you, Mr Speaker. British Vault entered into administration and doing so is a regrettable situation and our thoughts are with the company's employees and their families at this time. The Government is entirely committed to the future of the automotive industry and promoting EV capability. As part of our efforts to see British companies succeed in the industry, we offered significant support to British Vault through the Automotive Transformation Fund on the condition on the condition that key milestones, including private sector investment commitments, were met. Unfortunately, Mr Speaker, the company were unable to meet these conditions and, as a result, no ATF funds were paid out. Throughout the process, we have always remained hopeful that British Vault would find a suitable investor and we are disappointed 
that this hasn't been possible. We want to ensure the best outcome for the site, and we will work closely with the local authority and potential investors in order to achieve this. The automotive industry is a vital part of the UK economy, and it's integral to delivering levelling up, net zero and advancing global Britain. And we'll continue to take steps to champion uh, the UK as the best location in the world for automotive manufacturing as we transition to uh, electric and zero emission vehicles. Des despite what the uh, party opposite may claim, uh, we are not giving up on the automotive industry. On the contrary, our ambition to scale up the EV industry on our shores is greater than ever. We're leveraging investment from industry by providing government support for new plants and upgrades to ensure that the aut UK automotive industry thrives into the future. Companies continue to show confidence in the UK, announcing major investments across the country, including a billion pounds from Nissan and Envision to create an EV manufacturing hub in Sunderland, 100 million pounds from Stellantis for their site in Ellesmere Port, and 380 million pounds from Ford to make Halewood their first EV component site in Europe. And we will continue to work through our Automotive Transformation Fund to build a globally competitive electric vehicle supply chain in the UK, boosting homegrown EV battery production, levelling up and advancing to a greener future. Jonathan Reynolds. Mr Speaker, when the British Vault site was first announced in 2019 with the promise to build the UK's second ever gigafactory and create 8,000 jobs in Northumberland, it was lauded by the government as their flagship example of levelling up. The member for Spelthorne, then Business Secretary, said British Vault is exactly what levelling up looks like. And government ministers fell over themselves to take the credit. And so now they must also accept some accountability for its failure. Because much like their levelling up strategy, all we have been left with is an empty space instead of what was promised. The collapse of British Vault into administration is in no uncertain terms a disaster for the UK car industry. But what is even more worrying is that it is a symptom of a much wider failure. The automotive manufacturing sector currently employs over 182,000 people. And if we are to continue to make cars in this country, we must make electric batteries in the UK. The Faraday Institute says we need 10 factories by 2040 to sustain our automotive sector. So even if British Vault were going ahead, we would still be nowhere near where we need to be. And these factories are being built in competitor countries. And that is because they have governments with the vision and commitment to be the partner private firms need to turn these factories from plans on paper into a reality. So surely the government must accept that we do now need an industrial strategy. Will the Minister update the House on the Government's plans to urgently increase the battery making capability of the UK? Can he tell us when did the Government first have concerns about British Vault's ability to deliver the factory? And why did these concerns not come to light when the Department conducted its extensive due diligence investigations into British Vault's plans? What conversations has he had with other companies to secure the site and ensure the factory is built in Blythe? And will he now commit to Labour's plans to build eight new gigafactories across the UK and expand the rollout of <coughs> charging points to support electric vehicle manufacturing? Wherever you look, Mr Speaker, the Conservatives are failing this country, whether it's public services or in our iconic British industries. And unless this government wakes up to the scale of the transition that is required, we will not only risk many of the good jobs so many of our communities rely upon, we will miss out on one of the greatest economic opportunities this country has ever had. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, uh, the Honourable Gentleman is right about one thing, and that is there is a tremendous opportunity. Yeah. That's why we